Good morning, everybody. How is it going? We are talking about two women on the wrong side of the law today. We are talking about Anne Woodward and Ching Shi. Uh, we're going to start with Ching Shi as her story happened first in the early 1800s, and then Anne Woodward happened in the 1950s. Yep. Women shrouded by mystery. So, do we want to do both of the fun facts at the same time, or do, I, do you want me to just do my fun facts and then jump into it? Well, I mean, we usually do them at the same time, so why not? Sure. So, for my fun fact, I looked, because, you know, all right, so a little bit about Ching Chi before I get into it. She was a very, very famous pirate. So I looked into movies, TV series, or anything about this absolutely badass woman. And the only things that I could find were two projects listed on IMDb as in development, which one was a series referred to as Red Flags or Queen of Canton that looks like it was being developed in 2014 and then just vanished, like no progress updates since then. That was disappointing. The other was a half hour episode of Puppet History on YouTube called Ching Shi, the Pirate Queen that came out in 2021. I watched it. It's pretty hilarious. I do recommend. I kind of, I think um, I've seen some of the pirate, like the puppet histories and they're pretty good. They're pretty good. And then there was mention of a TV series available to Chinese audiences in one of my sources, but the article didn't include a title, so I couldn't track that one down. Oh no. There are, I know, there are a few documentaries on YouTube you can watch, but this woman really needs her own Pirates of the Caribbean-esque adventure because holy, the shenanigans that they get up to is like wild but speaking of pirates of the caribbean she does make an appearance in pirates as a member of the pirate council but she's portrayed as a brothel madam in a movie set before she was born so not the most accurate probably like yeah not the most accurate representation um there I'm going isn't to like there isn't an accurate you. representation in pirates yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, like, they did, like, Blackbeard, and they had him set in, like, the right time frame and stuff, right? Right? And they gave him, like, you know, the title and the reputation that he had and things like that. Like, it's just... Yeah, they did it for the ones that are, like, more well-known that people are actually going to, like, know, and then the other ones are like, eh, we can just shove you in because you're a pirate. But she's so badass. Like, she's so badass. So yeah, I don't know who, but I think someone needs to get on making a, a movie about this fleet because there was a lot going on. It like, yeah, like this, this was more than one pirate on a ship. This is like the power that this woman grew to have is insane. And we'll get into that in a minute. But Ashley, first, what's your fun fact? So I decided to do my fun fact a little bit on like the literary side, because in And story, there's a key pivotal moment of her life where a piece of literature is everything. Um, But I wanted to do my fun fact with a different book that we kind of talked about with like another episode that we did. Mm -hmm. So... Truman Capote wrote Breakfast at Tiffany's as a novella in 1958. Yeah. And it's one of his best known creations. Um, But in early drafts, her name was Connie Gustafson. (laughs) I know. Okay. (laughs) And as he does with every single one of his novels, he based the character of Holly on several different women who are all friends or close acquaintances of his. Okay. So claims have been made, um, but the four kind of like main ones that people look at are Gloria Vanderbilt. She'll come up later too. Una O'Neill, Susie Parker, and Marilyn Monroe. That makes sense. Because, yeah, like he was everywhere. Like he knew like pretty much everybody. So these are all people that he had connections with. He was, like, friends with them personally. Friends or acquaintances. Cool. Or acquaintances. Fair enough. Where basically, like, he would go to all these socialite parties and watch. And they would all trust him. He'd get, like, their secrets. And then and he just publish observed. it in 
novels where people pretty much knew exactly who was who because he didn't not he it's gonna come up a little bit later but he doesn't always hide them very well oh no (laughs) oh no so you know um that reminds me of like fictional books where there's like a disclaimer at the beginning where it's like this is a fictional story any correlation to like real people or events is purely coincidental like it's got that little disclaimer in the very front it it reminds me of that, but it's like, okay, but you did it wrong, though. <laughs> I don't think he ever wrote that disclaimer. I don't think he cared enough. He like, tried. he was a shit it's disturber. It's like, no, not a coincidence. It is exactly who you think it is. Like, Pretty he's just much. out here outing everybody's secrets. Pretty much. <laughs> That's kind of shady. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, but yeah, he'll come up later. Gloria Vanderbilt will come up a little bit later. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. All right. So with that, Ashley, what do you know about the pirate queen herself, Chang Shi? Pretty much nothing. Okay. I never, this I is... never was a big pirate person, so like, I didn't ever really look into a lot of like historical pirates. <laughs> the journey that we are about to embark on. <laughs> okay. She, she's literally one of the most infamous pirates and probably the most successful pirate in history. She is the pirate rags to riches story, so much so that we know almost nothing about her upbringing. She was known by multiple names, uh, and so many that I can't actually figure out which one is her real name. A lot of them are nicknames that mean things uh, that, did I write any of them down? Oh no, I'm dumb. Tisk tisk. I know. There's, there was a bunch. Uh, there's some of them. I, I didn't want to like confuse it by referring to her as too many names. So I kind of just stuck to two mainly. She was known by multiple names. So many that I can't like, we don't really know which one is her like actual birth name. My sources gave conflicting information on that. One saying that her birth name was Sek Young. Another saying it was Shi Yang, another said it was unknown, and half of them just glazed over it entirely, sticking to calling her Ching Shi. She had a lot of other like nicknames as well through various stages of her life and her career. So I'm going to keep it simple by sticking with Ching Sao and Ching Shi, since those were the ones that she was most known by at the time. Okay. I also need to preface this story in a similar way that I did for Anne Bonnie and the Mary Reed story. This is a story about a pirate. In this case, an extremely successful pirate. So I'm going to have to do my best to make clear what we know as fact and what could just be legend. Um, But a lot of what you're about to hear is going to be up in the air. We do not have a lot of documents about the life of Ching Shi. Most of the documents from the time focus on her husband's and very few of them focus, like pay her much attention. This is in the early 1800s, so yeah. <laughs> you can kind of, we can kind of make our conclusions about why that might be. But from what we can piece together, this is the Ching Shi story as far as I can tell. But I'm not going to say that everything here is 100% fact. I will try to clarify when we come across something that we do know happened. But yeah, a lot of this is going to be up in the air. That's the fun thing about pirates. Maybe it happened. Maybe it's a little exaggerated. We don't know. It's pirates. <laughs> so my goal here, yeah, is to tell the story as best as I can, and I will, and it will be up to you to decide what you think is like most likely the truth outside of what we know for sure and what is most likely legend. So that being said, this is more or less the story of the pirate queen. And I don't say that lightly, like this this woman is a powerhouse. <laughs> So like I said, we know practically nothing about her childhood. We know that she was born sometime in the early 1770s. Uh, We think she was born somewhere around 1775. We know that she existed, that like she was real from reports about her once she was already leading a fleet of pirates. So if she hadn't gone down that path, she probably would have been forgotten to history completely, to be entirely honest. Um, What we do know of her story sorry what we know of her story starts in a seafaring brothel where Chang worked as a sex worker story goes that she was incredibly beautiful 
I couldn't find any verified artwork of her. All we have are a few popular artist interpretations of which of what she might have looked like and a photograph of a Japanese woman, uh, which was taken about a century too late. Ching Chi is Chinese, by the way. I don't know if I actually said that yet, but they're not the same. Definitely not the same person. No. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of a, like a trust me, trust me bro moment, but like I'm kind of inclined to believe it because of all people, she got the attention of a massively successful pirate, Cheng Yi. So he was already an ambitious pirate lord at the time, commanding a group of pirates called the Red Flag Fleet, which honestly was not uncommon among Chinese pirates during the Qing Dynasty to work in groups of fleets. Um, a reportedly weak navy and political turmoil at the time that made for a ripe hunting ground for pirates. The population had exploded, leaving a lot of people and not a lot of work available. So a lot of regular farmers turned to piracy to to provide for their families. When I was gonna say, like Pir having a fleet, like safety in numbers, safety you're way numbers, more likely sure to numbers. get the goods if there's more of you. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Like, and a lot of people grouped into fleets um, and became like privateers, and uh, in, especially in the southern part of the region, um, those people were backed by the Vietnamese government as a form of like under the table, like uh, as their way of making like an under the table makeshift Navy. Cause like the Vietnamese couldn't afford to build a Navy of their own, yeah. but they wanted one to fight against the Chinese. So they hired Chinese pirates and like financially backed them instead because that was cheaper for them. I mean, that's smart. That's smart and that's incentive. And because it was kind of turned into this like black market dealing sort of situation, then that's part of why there are so many pirates and why they grouped into fleets. It kind of became like a more like viable way to like provide for yourself, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> In my notes, it said Vietnam couldn't afford their own navy, but they weren't getting along with the Chinese Empire. So, pirates. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to summarize. Good job, Pass Kate. Like, good. You you can infiltrate. <laughs> You already yeah. don't like your, like, if you're a pirate, you're not too happy mm -hmm. with your current government. Mm -hmm. well, we'll use you. Could, <laughs> and from what I could see, it's not like they were, like, passing down orders to the pirates or anything. They were just like, here's some money, go stir some shit up. Like, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious to me in, like, a, yeah, very far removed from it, historical sense. But even for that time, Ching Yi was a boss. Uh, and he met a gorgeous woman, so he decided, yes, that one. Uh, I say it was her beauty because legend says it was her beauty. It could have been fine, no one knows but them. Um, the story split off here. Some say that he came in with his crew, scooped her up, and ran off with her, uh, you know, kind of kidnapping her more or less against her will. Others say that he courted her and then ran away with her, and it was, like, a lot more consensual. No one knows. At this point, we just don't have enough information. Um, they or make a deal. he used the money from the Vietnamese government and paid off her debt and then took her. She, I don't know. There wasn't any mention of her having that. There's no lead up as to like why she's a sex worker in the brothel, in the brothel or anything. Like there's okay. no like anything like that. But I just say that he came in, he saw her, he met her, he liked her, he ran away with her one way or the other. Um, one version of the story is that he runs off with her and uh, that when she gets on his ship, she sees him and she slaps him across the face and she says that like, you know, if you want to marry me, then you have to give me 50% of your business. And he's like, yeah, bet. And then they do it. Um, other, <laughs> the other version is that, you know, he courted her for, for a while. She wanted to go along with him but she was she didn't want to be left on the sidelines and she said you make me part of this business and like i'm coming with you and you're not leaving me behind and then he says yes good plan so either way they do end up making a deal that she'll marry him on the condition that he doesn't leave her behind to worry and wait on the shore but rather he allows her to be involved in his business and come along on his pirating adventures so they get married. Respect for both. Actually, respect for both of them. I was to say, like, respect for her for being like, no, this is what I want. Like, I don't yeah. like. I want to be part of this. And respect to mm -hmm. him 
for not being like absolutely not we're marrying you're just staying here on the land <laughs> so this is an interesting thing <clears throat> sorry so this is an interesting thing it apparently wasn't uncommon for chinese pirates to have their families along with them okay yeah so that's like they were like children like women and children were on the boat and the wives of pirates would often come along and fight alongside their husbands Interesting. the difference being the difference being that he's the leader of this group so he's not necessarily like on front lines in the fray which would make more sense as to why she would be like left behind where she would be safe right because she'd be more protected but she was like no screw that leader no i'm i'm like with you yeah um so yeah, still major props, major major respect. Um, but yeah, it wasn't like completely unheard of to have a woman on board in this area. Well, I'm just like thinking about like just like the Chinese customs and stuff that you hear about from history. Where I'm like, mm-hmm. like he totally could have decided to use those customs, right? Like, yeah. So that's why I'm like major freaking respect, man. <laughs> and this is the difference between like pirate culture and like mainland like, culture <laughs> mainland society yeah, yeah is that like it's a different thing it's different rules and it's so interesting to me so yeah so they get married in 1801 she gains 50 percent of his profits and control over one of his fleets and they become a power couple almost immediately like he's got this big b- established business he's already made a name for himself and now she joins him in the system and weaves herself into all of it like he was doing all right without her she joins him and business is just booming that's good. So it, it's good timing. She's absolutely using the opportunity to like learn everything specifically on like the leadership and business end, I imagine, um, and quickly works to make herself invaluable to everyone and give advice to Cheng Yi that helps him expand his empire beyond anything anyone had ever seen. She started uh, going by one of her names, Cheng Yi Sao, which roughly translates to Cheng's wife. Uh, and the two of them together are just unstoppable. That's actually like, kind of which... interesting. Like, did he have a pretty big like? Like, did every like was like were other people and pirates and stuff like afraid of him? Because I'm like, that's an interesting name to call yourself. Like, especially if it's like, hey, look, this is my husband. Yeah, right. Like, don't yeah. mess with me because then you're gonna be messing with him. <laughs> He was already known at that point. He was one of the bigger fleets. I think he was the big, like he might've been the biggest at the time, but like he he was definitely up and coming. Like he, like there wasn't really anybody that was like specifically bigger than him at at that point from what I could tell, but he wasn't nearly as big as he was going to be yet, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, it was, yeah, so it was definitely like he had a recognizable name. The Red Flag fleet, fleet had already been established as a group that you don't mess with. Okay. But they were only just getting started. Gotcha. Yeah, so these guys are like the power couple to end all power couples, essentially running a massive oceanic crime syndicate and growing it by convincing other pirate fleets to join them. So pretty shortly after they get married, they adopted a 15-year-old son with the intention of leaving him the inheritance. So the boy's name was Chang Hao, and he had been the son of a fisherman until Chang Yi kidnapped him, adopted him, borrowed him. I just, it's kind of, I don't really know, but they acquired him uh, okay. one way or the other. <laughs> and introduced him to piracy and made him a captain. Um, one source said that uh, Chang Pao and Chang Yi were bisexual lovers, and the adoption was just them taking advantage of a legal loophole to ensure that Chang Pao would inherit the pirate kingdom. And so that, like, if anything happened to Chang Yi, then, you know, it would go to Chang Pao. Okay. I don't totally, yeah, I don't totally get why these pirates cared so much about legality, but they were actually relatively legalistic, so this, like, could make sense. But again, there isn't exactly a journal that we can read to tell us for sure why people did the things they did. So keep your freaking journals. <laughs> so that's my that's my obligatory journal rant. Um, they all seem happy with whatever arrangement they had, though. Uh, we know he was like 
for sure adopted by them though. So I guess we can kind of think of those guys, the Prince of Pirates at this point. So in 1802, the Tae Sun dynasty in Vietnam was defeated and the privateers lost their investors. So Vietnam isn't financially backing the fleets anymore because they couldn't like the, the dynasty that was paying for it fell essentially. Okay. And, and then so, the new dynasty was like, and we don't want to deal with these people, like... Yeah, kind of, yeah. The shady, underhanded business that the other dynasty had going on, let's not continue that. Gotcha. <laughs> so Chang Yi and Chang Yi Sao jumped at the opportunity to recruit them all and added them to their numbers. So they had this massive, like, this massive amount of ships now. So they divided all these, like, new recruits into six fleets flying the colors red, green, yellow, blue, black, and white. Okay. So each of these fleets would fly under these different colored flags, and it, uh, uh, oh, and red, uh, with red being the largest, with 300 ships and 40,000 men. Jesus. When I say fleets. <laughs> like, that is like an army, basically. This is an army now. This is an army at this point. This is what I mean. So they had a name before when this happened and they like conglomerate all these other like fleets of pirates under the same name. Oh, <laughs> this is like unstoppable levels now. To be fair, the Red Fleet took up like most of their, like more than like half of everything was all in the Red Fleet. And then the rest was like scattered between these like other like smaller fleets. Um, but they flew them under these uh, different colored flags, like to keep them organized. So they'd be like, okay, red fleet's going here, green fleet's going there, and like, you know, would be able to like strategize that way. Yeah. At their peak, as a whole, they had somewhere around four hundred ships and seventy thousand men working under them. Jesus. Like this is literally enough to be their own nation. This is why I call them the king and queen of pirates. Like. This is an insane amount of people. Yeah. This is like, like genuinely like a pirate Cinderella story. And like, could you imagine like the view on the ocean if like all 400 ships were like going at the same time? Like, just a wall of ships. It's very like, I'd just be like, especially if you're like in like a little tiny like schooner or something being and stuff and you're like, (laughs) oh shit. (laughs) Imagine the trade ships that they were targeting. Like, it would have been, like, when the Red Fleet came in, the Red Fleet would come in and, like, battle with the Navy and stuff like that in order to, like, get them out of their way, essentially. They would come in, they'd be, like, a wall of ships. Like, it was, like, a like a sea fortress. Like, it's, like, it's such an intimidating sight. No wonder a pile of, like, trading ships and stuff needed to have, like, a convoy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, maybe we can uh, distract them long enough that you can find a loophole. <laughs> yeah. And just scoot on through. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote, this is like, literally like a pin, like a pirate Cinderella story. Like this girl, we know nothing about her background. She comes up from, you know, being like lower, like on the poverty scale, right? She mm-hmm. comes up, she gets married by this guy. And within like a couple years, they have this massive pirate empire, like, what? <laughs> yeah. Crazy. So Cheng Yi may have been the may have been the figurehead, but Cheng Yi Sao was really kind of the one working behind the scenes to keep them all in line, strategically choosing only the most loyal leaders for each fleet and limiting their actual authority over the fleets so she and her husband could maintain control. Everything is going well. They saw success in battle and everything is perfect. And then comes the typhoon. Uh oh, so Mother he, Nature. Uh huh. Mother Nature's gonna gonna wreck them if no one else can. So, eighteen oh seven, a typhoon off the coast of Vietnam took out Pirate King Chang E, who drowned in the storm. Chang E Sao started going by a new name, Chang Shi or Chang's widow. Instead of retiring like she was kind of expected to. She found a way to continue holding control over her pirate kingdom. She married the new ruler, her adopted son. I'm sorry. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So from what I could gather, <laughs> here's the thing. From what I could gather, it seems like they chose him and adopted him so that he would take the inheritance 
So the adopted son is kind of a legality. Like, it's weird. He it's... was 15 when they met. She was like 22, 25, somewhere around there. So, like, it's odd by modern standards, but it wasn't unheard of then. Okay. History is full of incest. I don't no, know. No, I like, know. At least he's adopted and not their actual son. I don't know. <laughs> but, like, if he was kind of raised as a like their son like that'd still be like mentally yeah but like that'd still be like mentally yeah. odd yeah yeah i mean yeah like it's and like i said before like sources like we don't have a lot of information about what this relationship was actually like it not impossible that he was initially brought in to be like a a polyamorous addition to like Chang Yi and Chang Sao's or Chang Shi's yeah Chang Sao at that point um like their relationship like it's like uh, it could have been a thruple but like it's like uh, the age thing and then like the adoption thing like was the adoption a technicality or did they like see him as their son like it's weird yeah well and especially if he was like kidnapped like where he was taken against his will and now is like <laughs> like I mean he gets all this power and wealth so like he's fine with it at this point there wasn't anything about him like trying to defect or like leave yeah. or anything so mm, I don't know this is one of those things where it's just like I mean they seem happy <laughs> yeah huh okay yeah I don't know sure I don't know <laughs> I really don't know how to take this part. It's just odd. But yeah, they married and they did end up having, like, we know they ended up having a sexual relationship because years later she had a child by him. So, like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, but from what I could gather, he was like a little bit of a puppet king. Like, he, she would make all the decisions and he would decree them. Um, so among these decisions were a very strict list of rules that she demanded every pirate in their coalition follow. I've got a list of five rules for you here. For you here. Are you ready? Yes. Let's see if you could follow these rules and uh, see, if, see if this would be an easy thing to uphold as a pirate, mind you. So, so the rule number one was orders followed a strict top-down chain of command. Giving orders that undermined like your higher ups or without the permission of your superiors was punishable by immediate death. Okay. So any raid or business business transaction, I say in quotes, uh, was overseen by Chang Shi. Crew kept 20%, but the rest she took as a sort of tax to take care of all the ships and their crews. Stealing from this fund was punished by immediate death. Okay. Here's an interesting one. Women captured during raids were not to be harmed because they were too valuable. Beautiful women would be sold into slavery or sexual slavery. And those who weren't beautiful enough, again, I say in quotes, I don't know what the standard was, would just be freed immediately. So women were not to be harmed by the pirates. If any pirates raped these women, the pirate was punished by immediate death. Okay. If any pirate... Yeah, if any pirates had consensual sex with these women, they would both be punished by immediate death. A pirate could, however, take one of these women as his concubine or wife, but he was then bound by pirate law to be faithful to her for the rest of his life and take care of her for the rest of his life, or it would be punished by immediate death. Okay, I'm kind of confused about, like, selling them into, like, slavery or the sex trade because like she came from that yes so she knows how profitable it is but does she not like i would have been like no. i would like as soon as you said like okay women are not to be harmed I'm like oh good like she's going to mm -hmm. rally for the women but no <laughs> women are not to be harmed because they're a valuable commodity she doesn't care Fucking... about them as people she is a pirate her morals are the darkest of gray yeah, but right. i hope that she would be like okay Women don't be harmed because they are women and they are valuable because they are a valuable member of no. society, not that they're a valuable commodity. No, they're a valuable commodity. They're going to make her money. That's what she cares about. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Yeah. I had hopes and so, now they've been dashed. <laughs> Rule three is so, what dashed my hopes. I will, say, though, I will say, though, the women that weren't able to be sold got away without being harmed at all. So, like, those women were at least protected. But if you're no. a beautiful woman in this case... Because like, then they would just yeah. go off to be in poverty and yeah, probably still harm. Like, you're not getting murdered or raped, so, like, I'll take being poor over being... Who knows what happened to them when they left the ship? They weren't hurt by the pirates. I like, That's all that they can control. That's all that they can guarantee. Yeah. It's, it is interesting, though, because a lot of my sources looked at this like, yeah, she's protecting women! And it's like, yeah, to sell them against their will, though. Like, I don't know that anyone was paying quite enough attention to that part. I don't, like... She wasn't exactly a woman's champion. She was a champion of making herself money. Yeah, because I'm like... That point. She's a pirate. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that she'd be like hey, come work for us and be, and we can be badass women pirates. Like, join our crew because we're just as good, like. No, not quite. Not quite. Uh... She knew she was just as good, but no, she saw everyone as a, a means to increasing her wealth. And for other women captured during raids, the quickest way for them to increase her wealth was to sell them, and so she did. Pirate. Rule number four. (laughs) What's rule number four? (laughs) Rule number four. Villagers who paid the pirates for protection were not to be targeted. If a pirate harmed or stole from a villager who paid their bills on time, it would be punished by immediate death. Okay. Yeah. And rule number five. If a pirate deserted or went AWOL, it was punished by... Take a guess. Immediate death. Wrong! It's so much worse. Their ears would be cut off and they would be paraded in front of their peers to be mocked relentlessly. And then immediate death? No. (laughs) They just had to live like that. Okay. (laughs) No, that's the only one that's, like, not punished by immediate death. It's like, oh, you you wanted to desert? Guess what? You're stuck with us for even longer now. Like, no out for you. It's like, oh, gosh, that's brutal. (laughs) Okay. Gotcha. I wonder how yeah. many planks these ships had. <laughs> Usually it was by beheading from what I could see. Oh. There were a few other like more minor methods of punishment as well for more minor infractions, but these were the big ones. Well, as long as they had the weights and buried them at sea at the appropriate depths. <laughs> <laughs> I think in ni- in the early 1900s, the depth was it had to be like 600 meters or something. Was like how lo- like how deep it had to be for burials at sea, and you had to have like Why the appropriate you... weight to keep the body down so that it didn't float up, kind of a thing. Couple things. This is the early eighteen hundreds, so I don't know if that was applied yet. And second of all, why do you just know this off the top of your head? <laughs> um, I may or may not have been watching a documentary <laughs> about the aftermath of the Titanic, including the ship that went to go find the bodies from Halifax. Um, and they had to talk and they were talking and they had to do some burials at sea because they weren't given enough coffins. Oof. So if you were unidentifiable, like you had too much trauma or whatever, right? Or like things happened in the water before but because they took them a couple days before they could get there those bodies were ones that they would then do a burial at sea and they had to make sure that they were at the right sea level with the the correct weight attached like in the body and the way had to be like in the body bag kind of like kind of a thing right because they're like yeah like we can't have them coming up and yeah just stuff, right? floating around I yeah. mean, they were nice enough that they did label each of the bags with the number. Mm-hmm. So, like, if they were ever found again, right, like, with yeah. their bones or whatever, then, cause then you could still go to the Titanic exactly. archive and actually, like, mm-hmm. and then possibly identify them later on with, like, the newer forensics. But, yeah, God, that's yeah. that's how I have it off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a fair answer. I was expecting something much darker. Say good job. <laughs> no, I was just <laughs> doing my morbid Titanic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, long 
not the longest, but like strict set of rules. You kind of get the gist of it. It's like basically like, look, here's how I intend to run my business. If you defer from this, like there's harsh, severe punishments and it was strictly upheld. But they, this wasn't the only tactic that they used to keep their pirates in line. If you have like a list of rules, especially among pirates, um, and just are just brutal all the time, like you're gonna have people questioning you and trying to, you know, break off, make a name for themselves and stuff, right? So we don't want that. So the other tactics that they used included religious manipulation to keep their pirates in line uh, by building a floating temple, hiring priests to act as religious counsel, and then instructing them to always tell the people that the gods approved of Ching Shi and Ching Pao's plans. So anytime people went to the priests to be like, hey, they're saying that we should do this are the gods in favor of this is this a good move uh the priests were like paid to just always say that yep the gods approve they have a good plan it's going to work out and just like constantly reaffirm 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 and just basically lie out of their faces okay that's not a cardinal sin at all <laughs> so this yeah, reassured the crews that they were on the right path and probably invigorated them in battle fighting with confidence that the gods were on their side. So she also branched out into the salt trade, which was a tactic not just for like controlling her crew, but also just like expanding and like taking care of her crew, right? Um, so she, so salt was an insanely valuable resource at the time, right? Like, yeah. you know, used for preserving foods. Like it's just wherever, you know, every country was always trying to get their hands on salt. So she sent her crew out uh, into the salt trade routes and had them steal as much salt as they could. Uh, they would only sell it when and to whom Cheng Shi decided, thereby driving up the market and giving her control over like the majority of the salt trade. Smart, smart move. She just cut them off in the middle and just steal it all. And then she, it's kind of like the diamond thing now where there's like, there's lots of diamonds, but they're all owned by like one particular family particular family yeah it was like very ben rants about this all the time ever since he found out when he was buying my engagement ring this is like every time diamonds come up he's like do you know how shady that business is and i'm like yes you've told me i'm like unless you're um, spence diamonds where they have like the plasma chamber or something and you can yeah. spend like forty thousand dollars to get your diamond ring yeah no like i like the like the real diamonds like there's so many diamonds in the world it's just that they're all in warehouses owned by this one family who then decides like we're going to sell this many this year we're going to sell this many this year so it drives up it, it lessens the amount of supply which means that like if your demand is like kind of if, if you have a high enough demand and you have a lower supply then you can raise the price on it and they control the diamond market like entirely that way right so she's kind of doing the same thing but with the salt trade yeah so uh salt traders would have to pay her for protection as well that's the other way that she made money off of this um by buying official documents that guaranteed their safety that the pirates had to respect uh and she made absolutely like absolute bank by essentially forcing the salt supply salt supply chain to go through her. They actually had like offices where you had to go in to apply for these official documents to be protected by the pirates. It's kind of hilarious how legalist this all, this all is. I mean, it's pirate legal. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I mean. She she essentially just like created her own government. Yeah. Over this pirate fleet and started just like inflicting it on everybody else, like. So yeah, so then what did she do with the profits from all this? Because she made a lot of money doing it. Um, she used the profits that she made from this everything with the salt trade to invest in her crew, buying food, weapons, and supplies, and reward them to keep them loyal. And it worked. She maintained control, fought and won battles left and right, and ruled one of the largest navies in the world. Uh, she also had an intelligence network running for her so that she knew everything all of the time. It started with just regular civilians willing, willingly offering information in return for her favor and grew to receiving information from other gangs all the way up to cor corrupt government officials. So when the government was planning to do something, she'd get tipped off and she'd be ready for it and she'd have her strategies and her action plans and like her ships would all be ready to go. That is smart. Mm hmm So this goes on for years, right? And then in... uh. I know, 1807, 
Chang Yi died 1808, the Chinese government knew that they like kind of clicked in that like, oh, Chang Yi passed away, but like this problem isn't going away. So, you know, they realized they were going to have to do something about it. So they tried to take them up, take them down. They sent in 135 ships from the Chekiang province to solve the pirate problem. They lost, and in six months, the Chekiang general was killed in battle. The Red Fleet defeated uh, 63 Navy ships and, quote, convinced hundreds of sailors uh, to join them. That backfired on the government? Yeah, like a lot. So, <laughs> Well, like, by this point, how many ships would they have had? Like, over 400? Uh-huh. Or this was some somewhere around four hundred, we'll say. As so like you whole, like the red, tripled, so you like it was tripled just the red fleet. This is uh, as a whole among all six of the different colors, right? Just the red fleet had yeah. like three hundred of them. So then it was like a hundred split between the rest. But like okay, you so come you, like, in like, the doubled, red fleet and you're gonna get messed up. I don't know why. Like you were down by half of the fucking fleet, and you thought you were gonna uh-huh. win that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, these are ships of varying sizes. Like, not all of them are like these big, massive ships. Some of them are little junkers where they're just like a little, like, skipper, essentially. Um, but they would use those, like, tactically and strategically. They would, uh, her favorite, I think I'm about to describe it here. Yeah. So, her one of her favorite tactics was she would send out her ships, like her big ships, and like a massive squad- squadrons, like a great wall of ships that would just run down whatever is in their way. Um, and like firing at them from afar to distract the target from the landing parties that she would send out in these smaller junkers to to like get in between, go land, and then just like finish the job by like physically fighting all the pirates that are worn down from this firing back and forth, right? So she'd like distract them with the big guns. The little guns would come in and just kind of start taking people out. That is super Sorry, smart. This directly in front of my screen. Like, where is she in, like, modern-day warfare? We could use her. Yeah, like, she's, like, a master strategist, right? Like, she's not, like, it's, and, like, to clarify, like, I'm not making any claims that Chang-Chi was, like, up at the front with sword in hand fighting the battle herself. Like, she was the strategist. She was, like, she was on a ship somewhere in the back, probably commanding all the rest. Like, she wasn't, like, personally taking these people out by, like, you know, one at a time on her own. But she was sending out her husband, and she was sending out everyone else, and it was her, like, tactics that essentially got them all this power. It was her strategies and her ambition and her, like, business mindset that feels like that's the wrong, like, it's her, like, um, yeah, she's just, she's just tactical in, like, everything that she does. Yeah. Yeah, so... With this, like, strategy, it's basically force of numbers, right? So military just could not compete. She was, uh, yeah, like I said, strategic master. In 1809, they started, like, kind of getting too big <laughs> for the area, that uh, for, the, for their focus, right? So they started branching outside of Chinese trade routes, having expanded so much that they were starting to reach the limit of what they could accomplish from that alone. And this is kind of where we start to, like, get the hint that the end is near. Because, unfortunately, any empire can only be spread so far. And Chang Shi's empire started reaching the point where it had grown beyond what it could defend. So That's not smart. (laughs) Sometimes gaining too much power is going to be your downfall. you got to learn the sweet balance. (laughs) Right? Like it's like the it's like the Roman Empire as well, right? Where they got so big that their borders were so widespread that it was like that it got impossible to defend. I kind of get the same vibe from this situation where they got they just they got too big. They got too big and they started getting too much attention. So and this wasn't the main cause of collapse, but it definitely added to the pressure. So uh Portugal, Siam the United States of America and England all had trade routes or ships in the general area, like passing in between, like underneath, because that's where like the um, uh, the India uh, East India Trading Company, yeah, the East India uh, Trading Company. That was like the route that they would take, right? So it was like a really popular trade route um, for like this multinational. Yeah, it's just. Like yeah. a really popular trade route for a bunch of these different countries, right? Yeah. A really, really important one. And that was like 
just a little bit south of like where Qingxi and like Qing Sao, I guess, and uh, Qing Yi had started. So she's like, okay, so we're getting too big for this area. So why don't we just like go south a little bit more and start attacking these other like multinational ships, right? Mm-hmm. Not that they hadn't ever attacked them before, but she kind of saw this as like, this is a good time to start focusing on them. Okay. So the emperor finally decided to accept help from foreign navies to fight back against the pirate problem. He had been offered before, turned it down because of national pride. But now he's like, all right, this is getting too big of a concern. It's affecting other people, like other trade routes and stuff as well. Now, like this is going to start getting real messy real quick if we don't get this under control. So yeah, so finally agrees to accept help. So the Portuguese offered six massive Navy warships uh, called Men of War. And the East India Company provided a ship as well. <clears throat> Quick note about the East India Company. This is an English company created to trade resources, traffic slaves, and also colonize the West Indies and East Asia. We should probably do an episode on them at some point, just because our history classes don't do it justice and it's an important topic, but I don't have time to get into all of that debacle today. Yeah. So over time, more ships joined this kind of multinational fleet. That, and started putting pressure on Cheng Shi and Cheng Pao's empire. They responded by sending out a letter to the Portuguese asking for four massive navy warships of their own and promising to give a few Chinese provinces to Portugal when they win against the empire. <laughs> the amount of confidence. Okay, okay. It was basically Cheng Pao being like, we're gonna beat them, so like, if you give us stuff now, we'll reward you when we do. And Portugal did not take the bait and refused. Good on Portugal. So the battles continued and the pirates started to, like, over time started to get worn down. The fleet leaders started doubting Cheng Shi and Cheng Pao, and uh, dissent started to kind of spread amongst the crew. Big problem when you're already getting outside pressure, you don't want inside pressure bubbling up as well. So Cheng, si Cheng Shi saw the end coming, and after a few particularly difficult battles with the Portuguese, including the Battle of the Tiger's Mouth, which ended with the Portuguese taking down one of their major pirate, like their major flagships, uh, scattering the smaller ships as they fled, and blockading the mouth of the river known as Baca Tigris, translated to Tiger's Mouth, trapping the pirates and cutting them off from their escape. After two weeks of being trapped by the blockade, Cheng Pao requested an emissary to surrender, but the leader of the Portuguese fleet, Jose Pinto Alc Alcoforado Isusa, I don't know if I said any of that right, I'm so sorry, um, surprised him by meeting with Cheng Pao himself and on, uh, like on Cheng Pao's flagship, which was a baller move. <laughs> yeah. So Cheng Pao respected it, and actually agreed to surrender, even confessing he had initiated surrender just to buy time to escape the blockade. Okay. So maybe so don't like, confess like, your plans, like Right. So he's like, Yeah, I need someone to come over to like negotiate surrender. And then like the leader of the people that you're fighting against is just like, Yeah, I'll step aboard your flagship and talk to you in person. And he was like, you know what? Maybe I will just actually surrender. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So so some versions of the story say that they broke through the blockade, but what, from what I can find, there seems to be more documentation that at least the Black Flag fleet surrendered at this point, which was like the second biggest fleet. Though I will note that I honestly did not and cannot read the original documents in this case because I am but a lowly monolingual and they are not written in English. So like, yeah, there's like American documentation that exists out there somewhere about some of these events, but they wouldn't necessarily have the details about the Chinese and Portuguese side that would have been the ones that I needed. So yeah, no primary sources for this one, unfortunately. Not that I've seen with my own eyes. Okay, so it wasn't long after this event that Chang Shi began to negotiate her surrender as well. Cheng Pao and Cheng Shi approached the governor general, Pai Ling, with a Portuguese mediator looking to negotiate. In exchange for dismantling the fleet and handing over most of her weapons and ships, they requested amnesty for them, as well as everyone who worked under them, positions in the Chinese Navy for the pirate lords, including Cheng Pao, and they wanted to keep 80 smaller ships and sailors to man them. 
Piling denied their offer, said, you're asking for too much. We're not going to do this. So the couch was standstill and Chang Shi grew tired of it. So she met with Pai Ling herself, accompanied by the wives and children of some of her men, but without her counsel and against her counsel's advice. She made the same request and added 40 more ships to be used for her business in the salt trade. Then Pai Ling accepted. <laughs> okay. Without giving anything more. I like this is one of the stranger negotiations I've ever like heard of. Like she's like, hey, I want all this stuff. And the guy's like, no. And then she's like, ah, oh, well, then I'll raise the cost. And he's like, yeah, now that's fine. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Unless it's just like a, oh, look, pretty women. Like. I have no idea. I have no idea. Like, because I wonder if it was like a display of like, look, these are the people that I'm trying to care for. Like, these are the people that I need to provide for. Give me what I need to provide for them. But I have no idea otherwise like i have no idea no <laughs> but regardless of work so Chang pao went on to work for the imperial army as a lieutenant uh for somewhere around a decade before also dying at sea dying at sea to another typhoon these typhoons Here, man it's like shakespeare these came typhoons. after them <laughs> <laughs> these typhoons will get you so Chang shi had two kids by Chang pao and ran a gambling house that may have also been a for the rest of her retirement. She also invested in the salt trade, not as a pirate. So when she eventually passed away in her sleep in 1844 at 68 or 69-ish, she died a wealthy widow and a free woman after enjoying a, dec a few decades of relative peace with her children. Wow. Or a pirate, not the worst ending. No, definitely not the worst ending. Considering Mary Reeves stuck in prison until she gave birth and then hanged and yeah and bonnie disappearing into the void it's not that bad no i was gonna say like she at least got to like continue gaining her wealth which apparently made her happy it was very important to her yes <laughs> so yeah change she the pirate queen okay mm -hmm. i mean yeah like you were right she's badass there's a few little loopholes that i'm like i don't know how you got through that <laughs> <laughs> I yeah there's there's definitely a couple things where it's like okay if you wrote this as a script and it wasn't history and this is like a work of fiction and you're describing this to me I'd be like come on there's no way like but you like, need to fix this plot hole right here and here <laughs> <laughs> right but like the things that we do know that happen are some of the like from what we can piece together from the documents like it's kind of more or less it. it's like how did you do that how did they agree to this like yeah like what did you have over him i don't know i think he'd be very cinematic yeah i agree especially like Definitely. i can see like the views of like all of those ships coming yeah like right? i can i'm just imagining like her in the war room with like a giant map in front of her she's like laying out like who's where and who's doing what and stuff and you know, sending out the commands and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Legitimate. Legitimately <laughs> one of the most, like, successful pirates in history. It's crazy. Yeah, definitely. If not the most. Yeah. And to get away with all that scot free at the end is just like, oh, right, how? <laughs> yeah. So, mine's not really a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> no. But there is some... Um climbing up from poverty to wealth and multiple generations of a family involved so yeah and also it's a story about a woman with multiple connections to previous women that i've talked about on this podcast okay and i didn't realize until i was doing the research nice Oh, I wanted to, real quick, Cheng Shi, she retired, it was like 1810, just before she retired, so that's like two years before the pirate attack that took out Theodosia Burr. Oh, that was wow. the other thing that I was thinking about too, right? Was that like, because the other pirates were like way before this. Yeah. But I was thinking about Theodosia Burr in 1812 being potentially, you know, raided by pirates, and I was like, is there any chance? But no, they're on different different sides of the world and she retired like two years too soon yeah wow mm -hmm. that's 
Like, it's insane how close a lot of people are to, like, the various events and stuff, right? The connections. I always love the connections. Yeah. So, you said you're... You have a, just a little bit of behind the scenes. For Anne Woodward, Ashley has the only thing written next to her is socialite murderess. Yes. <laughs> and so, I'm trying to think of, like, who she'd be connected to as a socialite in the 50s. There's a few. There's a few. There's quite a few. So, yeah, but even, like, the idea of her being a murderess is contention. So, mm. it's kind of, so it is a little bit of, like, that pirate story of, like, fact versus legend and people's gotcha. perceptions. So, yeah. You don't totally know for sure. Yeah. Um, gotcha. So, yeah, I first found out about Anne when I got an advanced copy of a new nonfiction book um, that was published about her life slash her battle with an author. Um, I do recommend giving Deliberate Cruelty by Roseanne Montello a read if you have a chance, as it's actually written, like, beautifully. Mm. Like, so many nonfiction books are kind of, like, boring, like, and this one's actually, like, it paints the picture a bit more. And like, it's separate. more narrative. Yeah. So, Anne was born Evangeline Lucille Crawwell... <laughs> On December 12th, 1915, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Okay. Her father was a streetcar conductor and a military veteran. That's pretty much all we know about her family. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> um, after attending the Kansas City Junior College for a year, she changed her name to Anne Eden, Anne without an E. Okay. Um, and moved to Kansas City on her own. This change was mainly due to her parents' divorce, and then ultimately both of them remarried. And she's like, peace, bye. Fair enough, okay. Um, in 1937, um, she decided to move to New York as she was becoming well-known for her beauty back in Kansas. Mm -hmm. She found work as a model for the John Roberts Powers Modeling Company um, before she landed roles as an radio actress like through the agency cool so in 1940 she was voted as the most beautiful girl in radio that's kind of an ironic thing to right be, like the most beautiful person in radio well to me no i'm like you. i'm like okay like radio you can't see them so like is it actually that she's the most beautiful girl who's or on like on radio or is it like but they'd say that the she's most got beautiful like a beautiful voice. voice like maybe they have like pictures of her floating around the newspapers or something so you can put a face to it yeah but like i can't find much about like this award in general interesting because i tried googling it to try and stuff right um and i kept getting like other awards not this one and i'm like what the heck like i want to know more about this actual like award like I, okay, so I just typed in most beautiful girl in radio, and the only thing that came up was a Wikipedia page for Anne Woodward. So it's like, is is this just for her then? What is this? Don't know. Like, There's also a Prince song called The Most Beautiful Girl in the World, but that's Yeah, not... like, that's all I got was like The Most Beautiful Girl in the World, nothing about like the radio, and I'm like, come on, like let's focus this down here. Huh. Interesting. Um, she also got a small role in the 1939 musical, Set to Music, but not much is known about her actual involvement in the show. Like, anything I saw about the show itself mainly had, like, your main cast. So, like, she wasn't, like, a leading role or anything. She was just, like, some sort of supportive role, but, like, who knows what she was because it was, like, a musical variety kind of performance. So, like, you had, like, your different sketches and stuff throughout the show that like various people would come in and play either multiple characters or you had multiple leading roles that would come in for like each part kind of like a saturday night live on broadway <laughs> <laughs> um but while she was working as a model and an actress Anne was also working as a showgirl at fifi's monte carlo a popular new york nightclub this is where she meets William Woodward Sr. Okay. So William Woodward Sr. was an extremely wealthy businessman whose money goes back on his father's side all the way back to colonial times. 
The family basically single-handedly ran the Hanover National Bank as William Sr. was vice president with his uncle as president. William Sr. became president of the bank from 1910 um, after his uncle's death until 1929 when the bank merged with the Central Union Trust Company. But that's not the only reason that this family was huge in New York society. The Woodward family inherited historic Bel Air mansion and 2,500 acre stu- uh, stud farm in Maryland. For any listeners who aren't well versed in the horse racing industry, Bel Air was the farm where the first imported thoroughbred horses to America were brought from England in 1747. Queen Mab and Spark were presented to the then governor of Maryland by the Prince of Wales himself. Oof. Um, so this is big deal, big name stuff. Yeah. Later, Sel- Salima was brought to the estate from England, and she became the mother of all American thoroughbreds, a.k.a. the most important thoroughbred of the 18th century. Whoa. So she produced a total of 10 foals who went on to win major races and then continue the American line of racehorses. It feels like that's a lot of babies. I don't know how many like babies is normal for horses, but that feels like a lot. For racehorses, you can have... Like, if they're breeding horses, then they can have quite a few. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like, I think now there's kind of, like, you kind of watch them with their health a bit more. At that time, it's basically just breed them. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is a money maker. Just keep breeding. Yeah. They didn't care as much as about the animal's well-being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Woodward family took over the mansion through the uncle who passed away in 1910. And the famous racing stables grew exponentially. Bel Air Stud is one of the only two stables to produce two Triple Crown champions and had a majorly successful breeding program. Um, Gallant, Fox, and Omaha also became the only father and son horses to win the Triple Crown. What I found interesting is that the stables had a total of six horses who won the Belmont Stakes, which is considered as the test of champions in the racing world, as it's like the last and the longest leg of the Triple Crown. Um, It's also like super close to the leg before it. Um, I think the horses only have like a two week rest between the Preakness and the Belmont while they get like a month between the Derby and the Preakness. The horse that was most well-known during Woodward Jr.'s ownership, Nashua, won both the Belmont and the Preakness. Nashua was the favorite to win the full Triple Crown, but was narrowly beaten by the second favorite, Swaps. The two horses had a rematch race where Nashua won and was voted as the American Horse of the Year. At retirement, Nashua won 22 out of 30 races. Wow. Fun fact, Elizabeth Wood's daughter um, sculpted the statue of Nashua that stands over the famous racehorse's grave. Aww. I thought that was, like, super interesting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, one of my favorite people. <laughs> Her daughter <laughs> sculpted so the statue. Cool. That's so cool. Both the mansion and the stable grounds were put to auction after Woodward Jr. passed away and became corporate offices until it was sold to the city and became two museums which are still running today. Now that I got to nerd out over the horses, I will reluctantly come back to the humans in this story. (laughs) Also, I love, I just, I love horse names. Like, they're like... Like right? racing horse names, like, they have the weirdest names sometimes, and I live for it. I love them. <laughs> Before I learned um, how to actually, like, read um, the racing book that you get every time you go to the races, mm-hmm. um, I just would pick it as to, like, the name or the color of the horse that I like the best. <laughs> um, or, like, my mom and I would go prettiest. stand at the paddock and I would watch mm-hmm. the horses and then tell her which one I wanted to bet on based on like how pretty the horse was. Aww. Then I and then we met somebody who taught me how to read and like yeah. taught me how to actually like what to look out for in the paddocks and then I started like winning money off I of it. I heard a story and I can't remember where I heard the story if it was like a work of fiction or like 
as though it was like a TV show or a book or what it was. I cannot remember for the life of me. But I remember hearing a story of someone who was explaining that they choose which horse to bet on by which horse is the happiest. Like they'll like watch the interaction between like horse and jockey and so whichever horse seems the happiest is the one that they bet on. And it, like, I can't remember if this was fiction or not. So them winning all the time may or may not have actually like been remnant, like had anything to do with real life, but. <laughs> I mean, though, that, like, that makes sense, though, because the relationship between the horse and the jockey mm-hmm. is a big part of horse racing. Like, there's so many times people are like, okay, this jockey's not getting what we need out of the horse, therefore we're going to move to another jockey to check and see how the horse and the jockey react to, like, and relate to each other. Because yeah. a horse that's afraid of the jockey is not going to run as well as the horse that's doing it because they want to do it for the rider and stuff right where the horse is like okay yeah. i want to do this for you yeah exactly um that makes sense but yeah so I know next to nothing about a horse racing just for the record <laughs> i know a lot i was a horse girl <laughs> um okay so when ann met woodward senior it is rumored that she became his mistress that's spicy okay but then was soon introduced to and courted by his son <laughs> What? Father introduced son to his mistress, and then they courted. You did say rumored, though, right? I'm going to lean real heavily on that rumored for a second, because, like... Well, it's rumored that she became his mistress. <laughs> Most people are like, no, they they were together because she, like, she'd be seen, like, canoodling. Like, they'd be seen canoodling and stuff at the club and various canoodling. things. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So okay. So she meets big fancy wealthy guy. She starts courting big fancy wealthy guy. Is that how we want to phrase it? And then it, like meets big fancy wealthy guy's son and is like, oh, actually that one. Well, like how? No, the rumor is that it's actually like Woodward Senior, who mm-hmm. kind of is like, hey, you two should meet kind of a thing so so he so big fancy wealthy guy sees pretty young girl starts canoodling with pretty young girl and then is like oh actually you'd be good for my son yeah i mean they're closer the son like son and side piece are the same age so (laughs) you've been canoodling yeah no longer for the son material (laughs) that's why i said there's (laughs) multi-generational That's so relations. Weird. But generation, I thought that like parents had children. I didn't think she like dated more than one generation from the same family. That's so uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Um. That's at least uh, yeah. That's that's like awkward levels almost to the yeah yeah not quite but almost to the same extent of Ching Shi marrying her adopted son. Yeah. So Woodward Junior, um, to be known as Bill for EVZ reference was smitten with the gorgeous showgirl and was probably used to getting what he wanted as the only son and the youngest child of an extremely wealthy family. Oh, no. Okay. The relationship between them was extremely controversial, but it didn't stop them from marrying in 1943. Mm -hmm. Bill's mother, Elizabeth Ogan Kreider Woodward, was probably the most vocal about her disapproval of the match, and New York society quickly shunned them for the initial few years of their marriage. Oh my god, the mom was still alive? Can you imagine? Like, yeah, my husband has a mistress. Oh, my son is marrying my husband's mistress. Like, uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, Elizabeth and then in return, the rest of New York society saw her as a gold digger and stuff, right? Like, that was kind of, like, her reputation because they're like, well, why else would she... Marry the son of the man that she was the mistress for? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of get that, not gonna lie. Um, The couple had two sons, William Woodward III and James Woodward. However, their marriage was far from happy as they both had numerous affairs one like one of the rumors was that she never stopped her affairs with his father no no but who no, knows if that's actually man. true because it's like it could just be new york society trying to like make her into a, even more of a villain i mean that's fair because she's just i really want that one to just be rumors because it's already bad enough that if it isn't 
Yeah. Like, whoa. <laughs> Bill requested a divorce in 1947, but Anne refused as she was happy, apparently, with the wealth that the marriage provided. No doubt she is. Um, I'm going to jump to 1955, as this is when most of the action of this story really happens. So, Anne and Bill lived in a neighborhood called Oyster Bay. Late in the year, a string of burglaries happened throughout the area, putting the wealthy residents on high alert. On October 30th, the couple returned home after attending a dinner party in honor of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, so the former King Edward and his wife Wallace Simpson who I have connections to myself because my great grandfather piped for King Edward at various events. Fancy. Anne and Bill slept in separate bedrooms of the home as usual um, when they were awoken to a noise on the roof. Both of them enjoyed hunting and they went to bed that night with a shotgun each just in case the burglar decided to strike their home next. Ooh. No one knows exactly what happened inside of the house for sure that night, but the facts are that Anne shot Bill twice, ultimately killing him. Ooh. She was found by the police holding him and sobbing on the floor between their two rooms. Did she say she thought it was a burglar or like... Anne swore that she thought he was the burglar in the darkness and only thought about protecting the children, who slept oh, but... through the whole thing. I... Somehow... It... They fucking I've heard slept. So many. I have heard so many true crime stories about people who shoot other people in the same house and the children sleep through it. And I just want to know, like, what are the parents giving these kids that they can sleep through that? Well, like, I don't like, understand. It's like with um, Evangeline and her throwing, like, the baby bath and somehow the freaking child sleeping through this thing. Yeah. I don't, like, I, I don't understand. Like, Yeah, I could never. (sighs) So a man named Paul Worth was later arrested by police, and he admitted to attempted burglary of the Woodward house on the night of the murder. His statement included the claim that he was scared out of the house by the sound of gunshots. Oh, shit. Okay, so she could have legitimately heard him breaking in and then saw someone, both of them probably came out with guns, and so, because if they each had a ri- rifle, right? Yeah. So she sees this random shadowy guy, like, with a rifle, middle of the night. Like, it kind of makes sense that she'd fire on him. Like, yeah. So Woodward's mm-hmm. mother absolutely believed that the son, that the death of her son was no accident. But ever the society woman, she supported Anne to the press in order to avoid herself being shunned. Mm, fair enough. Anne, however, was immediately shunned by society as she wasn't born into it, so they didn't see her as one of their own to protect. Gotcha. All juries in the subsequent trials deemed the incident as an accident, but society made up its mind and Anne was officially out. Even though her mother-in-law hated her guts, Anne and the children moved in with her for support and security. 20 years later, Anne's life would be turned upside down by a piece of fiction. Excerpts of Truman Capote's unpublished novel, Answered Prayers, were suddenly released prior to their expected publication in the November 1975 edition of Esquire magazine. I could take a guess as to where this is going. It doesn't sound like it's good for her. Many high society people who were friends with Capote were about to have their dirty little secrets aired to the public. Some of these people included the Paley family, who built CBS, Rockefeller's wife, Vanderbilt's wife, and the Woodward family. And that's only, like, a few of the ones that were being called out in this. Right. So, as I was saying before, he wasn't always the best at (laughs) making it even seem anything like it might not be (laughs) based on real people. So, a character in this novel was also named Anne, without an E, and this character ended up being a bigamist gold digger who shoots their husband. Exactly how high society saw Anne Woodward. (gasps) To make the reference even more clear, the fictional Anne also killed her husband by mistaking him for a burglar. 
Oh my, like that's not even subtle. Like, come on, man. You could do anything, anything to change the circumstances and make it like a little bit less obvious. Like, and in that the, may as well be a firearm. So like in the actual like novel and stuff, like it was basically that she used that excuse and that she apparently was doing the burglaries to prep so that it would make oh it so that the idea that it was a burglar would be... <laughs> So what about the guy that was like that said that he was a burglar and like said that he was trying to break in that night? Some so, people like, wonder if he was it? paid to say it by the mother oh so that there wouldn't be like that scandal around the family. Oh my god. Um, it's a very so people are like, well, we can't we can't guarantee that he was an actual person in this that he. It's very like he's not a reliable narrative for us because he could have been paid off easily by. <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. That's yeah. Huh. So there was very little doubt in anyone's mind as to who the fictional characters represented in the real world. Oof. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Unfortunately, the real Anne couldn't handle the public ridicule that came from the pending publications. No. Um, warning to viewers, listeners, this I'm um, going. This is going to be a little bit of talk um, of, yeah, some yes, hard I, terms. Um, we get where this is going. So she committed suicide by taking cyanide pills, um, October 9th of 1975. Mm. This is one part where I wanted to like remind people: do not trust Wikipedia pages, because in Anne's Wikipedia page, it has one date. On her husband's Wikipedia page, it has another date for her suicide, like within a day of each other. So I okay. actually went, found her grave on Find a Grave, yeah. looked at the actual gravestone to get the real date, which yeah. was October 9th, Sorry. not October tenth. <laughs> So, okay. if you're going to use Wikipedia as a resource, make sure you check other resources to ensure on dates. And this is why I say I always use it to get, like, an outline for yeah. what I'm looking for and give me tips as to, like, what I should start looking into. Like, exactly. For the direct source itself. Yeah. Um, so, her, her mother-in-law has been quoted as saying, Well, that's that. She shot my son and Truman just murdered her and now I suppose we don't have to worry about that anymore. Wow. Yeah, like, I literally want to say, I have honestly cold much? <laughs> Holy, that is the least sympathetic take I've ever heard. That's awful. Yeah. Um, Anne's friends later on say that Anne was already suffering from severe depression, which the publications yeah. just, like, pushed over the edge. She was 59 mm. years old. Sadly, though, that's not the last life taken by the pressure of society surrounding this case. Both okay. of Anne and William's sons took their own lives by jumping from windows due to the gossip and rumors that followed them everywhere. Oof. At least those are, like, the reasons are suspected by their loved ones. And those are innocent babies. Like, that's, like... Yeah. Aww. So, James Woodward took his life three years after his mother in 1978 at the age of 31. Okay, so not baby, but like... Um, William, also known as Woody uh, Woodward the third, did the same in 1999 at the age of 54. Oof. All four family members are laid to rest in the Woodward family plot in Woodlawn Cemetery. Yes, this is where both Rebecca Harkness, who was around and in New York society at the same time as them, um, mm -hmm. and Nellie Bly are laid to rest as well. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I really feel for the kids because, like, I mean, I guess there weren't kids by the time, like, you know, but even still, like, to to lose your dad that way, to lose your mom because of all the rumors and the pressure and the, you know, everything. Yeah. Like... That's too much. That's 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 a lot. Like it's not like they did anything. Well, and like the fact that like it continue like that people continue to haunt them about it like after the yeah, fact. Yeah, like that. Oh. I'm like just leave those kids alone. Like they were children when this happened. They were sleeping. Yeah, they were kids when it happened. Like they didn't do anything. They were like like oh, yikes. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of like your basis of the story of Anne Woodward and the Woodward family. 
Um, the book definitely goes into a lot more, like, detail and stuff, but I wanted to kind of give, like, a bit more of just, like, an overview because a lot of it is also, like, ru- like society rumors and stuff, right? Which, of course, mm-hmm. went into the courtroom. So, like, even, like, your legal trials, you can't believe everything because it's a lot of people are like, untangle. oh, no, like, she totally would have murdered him because this is how we see her, right? Not as to yeah. who she actually was. And, of course, at that p- time still, you like you believe the high society more than anyone else. Yeah. So. Oof. I'll leave it up to everyone to decide if she is guilty or not of murdering her husband or <laughs> if it was an accidental shooting to protect the family. I wouldn't be surprised at accidental. Like, I don't... I could see, like, murdering him for the money. Like, that, that's a motive that does make sense. But, like, I don't know. Just everything about it, it... The vibe to me is accidental. There's, like, some rumors and stuff, like, where people are like, well, maybe it started out accidental, mm-hmm. but then she turned... But then she, when she figured... Like, when she kind of realized who it actually was standing there, that she just took that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Right, that it wasn't, shot. like, a premeditated murder, but that it was, like, a, oh, somebody's the... breaking in, get the gun, and then be like, oh, no, that's just my husband, hang on, but this is a great opportunity, bang, bang. <laughs> yeah. As I'm like, I don't know, like... I don't know, she doesn't seem quite, like, it's not like she had, like, a history of, I don't know, violence or anything, she seemed to just kind of be there, like, I don't think... I think that Mm. what people mainly look at is her history of trying to get in the pants of people who are richer. Big difference between trying to get in the pants of rich people and trying to murder rich people once you're in their pants, though. Like, I mean, she would gain... I feel like that's a pretty big line. She would have gained a lot, like, if she was actually... Sure, but, like... And she hated the guy. Well, yeah, but she also would have known that, like, she... The public scrutiny from, like so obviously killing him like yeah i don't know i just feel like in situations like that more women would lean towards like poison than gunfire of opportunity i don't know who knows although i think i think that by that point poisoning kind of became a little bit less common Um, with women like it like it was definitely super common back when it was like the inheritance powder Mm. Um, kind of a thing, but inheritance powder. That's what the that's what it used to be called. It was like the inheritance it? powder because that's what because a lot of women used arsenic so to gain inheritance. That's so dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think especially like with her reaction in the aftermath and everything, that screams accidental to me. Yeah, unless she was a really good actress. I mean, she was a radio actress. No one acts 24-7, though. No one can act 24-7. Unless the mom knew... Like, the mother-in-law could have known something. I'm just playing devil's advocate here, because I don't know what the to believe. The mother-in-law knew that her son married her husband's mistress. That's all you need to know to hate someone for the rest of your life. Like, that's like... <sighs> I don't know. Like... <sighs> Who knows? I'm just saying, if I was a mother and my son married my husband's mistress, I would freaking lose my shit at her constantly because like what the hell is that like yeah i'd also lose my shit at them too though but that's a good note for people if you think there's gonna be an intruder in your home don't take a gun to the fight because it may just be your husband (laughs) don't use a gun like literally there's so many stories about people accidentally shooting their loved ones because they thought they were an intruder don't use a freaking gun use like pepper spray or something it'll hurt it'll suck but it won't freaking kill the wrong person like or th- I saw someone do like a, a, it was like a little short video or something that said like literally just like night glasses and pepper spray. That's it. Don't be firing if you don't know who you're firing at. Just that's yeah. all you need. Like, Well, and also just uh, in general, don't have guns laying around. You, you never know, know right? who's going like, to pick it up. Because I know there's right? like ones where like parents take guns with them grocery shopping just in case, and then they've accidentally shot their kids oh, in the back seat by like <sighs> when they're putting like the gun down in between like the pass like the driver seat and the passenger oh, seat, and then they accidentally shoot their kid in the back seat. Which like, you don't need a gun, <sighs> gun to go grocery shopping. You don't need a gun oh, to go to the movie theater. 
like and maybe and maybe this is us speaking out of privilege because i'm sure there's some places where you do need like protection with you to go to those places but like come on like you know come on at least gun safety right like gun safety yeah (laughs) just don't fire guns at people that you don't know who you're firing at like (laughs) especially in the dark (laughs) especially in the dark come on like what if oh yeah i can't yeah i can't with that (laughs) yeah so yeah and Woodward and Ching Shi. Fun episode of women <laughs> that may or may not have killed. Well, we know we know yeah. Ching Shi killed, but we know Ching Shi was the cause. I don't know if she directly killed anybody, but we know she definitely ordered a lot of murders. So <sighs> I mean, then she's still responsible. Exactly right. And then yeah, we'll figure out what we're gonna do for next episode at some point. Yeah. We've got Jack the Ripper and H.H. H. Holmes next on the list. And I would be interested... Well, I mean, you had Jack the Ripper, and I was like, well, if you're talking about Jack the Ripper, and, like, it's such a well-known story, then it seems like a good opportunity to talk about well-known serial killers. And there's a plausible connection between Jack the Ripper and H.H. H. Holmes. So yeah. I, I think it's... Yeah. So I was thinking maybe I could do H.H. H. Holmes, and then we could talk about that. I love H.H. Well. H. Holmes. Yes. I love both He's of them. <laughs> I know less about Jack the Ripper. I know it's a little more about H.H. H. Holmes. Yeah, I know a lot about both. Mm-hmm. It's going to be another, like, of our James Dean and Audrey Hepburn episode. <laughs> yes. No, but I like that, though. That's fun. I mean, like, I'm the one who has a board game that's about Literally getting H. H. through H.H. H. H. Holmes' true. castle. That's true. And I also have a board game with Jack the Ripper, don't I? <laughs> Do you want me to leave it for you to talk about another time? Because I just think it's fitting to talk about both of them in the same episode. No, we can definitely talk about them both in the same episode. Okay. Because, yeah, because I know, yeah, because I'm like, I can, it can be just the same thing as with James Dean and Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. Because I know that there's some new stuff about Jack the Ripper that's interesting, so. Nice. All right. So, yeah, that will be next week then. Like, next time. We'll do our famous serial killers. Yes. All right. We'll see you all there.